Hello everybody, this is Dr. Leili Hatami. In this video, I'm going to cover the anatomical language lab. Let's start our lab one with some questions. What is anatomy and physiology? Why do you guys as a student in the medical field should know about these topics? The study of anatomy and physiology is essential for all health professionals. It provides answer to many questions about the functions of the body in both health and disease. As a result of this understanding, it is possible to see what happens to the body when it's injured, stressed, or contracts a disease or infection. You are beginning a fascinating and challenging study the study of human body. Let's see what human anatomy is. The human anatomy is the study of a structure of body parts and how they are organized. For example, when you want to talk about the anatomy of the heart, you should know where the heart is located at your body. What are all parts of the heart? What are the arteries, veins, nerves which supply the heart? And what is the relationship of heart to other organs? Whereas anatomy is about a structure, physiology is about function. Human physiology focuses on how organs like the heart is working. In summary, anatomy is all about study of structures and physiology is about the study of function. In our class in anatomy, we're going to study gross and microscopic anatomy. Gross anatomy considers large structures such as brain, heart, stomach. Uh, microscopic anatomy can deal with same structures through a different scales. This is a micrograph of nerve cell from the brain. So you're going to study brain, but with the magnification aids, with a microscope, cause we can see some structures that uh, we cannot see them with our naked eyes. We need the magnification aids to magnify them, to examine uh, these uh, structures. But this is how we're gonna study the gross anatomy without any magnification aids with our naked eyes we can look at the brain look at the heart and understand the structure of it anatomical terminology before we take a look at the meaning of specific anatomical terms, let's ask why should we learn anatomical terminology and how important is it? The study of anatomy is like traveling. For traveling, you need a correct and current map. And also you need to know the language to be able to read the map and understand people if you ask for help. Anatomy is exactly the same. They're going to need a correct and current map. This will come from your textbook, anatomy atlases, and tons of resources. You need to speak the language of anatomy, which is derived from Latin and Greek. That's why to study anatomy, the first step is to know the anatomical terminology. So in this lab, we're going over anatomical position directional terms, regional terms, body planes and sections, body cavities and membrane. Anatomical position. It's a standard position. You can see the anatomical position in this picture. In the anatomical position, the body is standing upright, directly facing the observer feet flat and directed forward. The upper limbs are at the body's side with the palms facing forward and thumbs out. So, upright, facing forward. Look at the condition of the arm and thumb. Thumb should be outside and palms should face forward. 
feet flat on the ground. This is how the anatomical position should be described. Using this standard position reduces confusion. It does not matter how the body being described is oriented. The terms are used as if it is in anatomical position. For example, a scar in the front wrist region <clears throat> would be present on the palm side of the wrist, even if the hand mm, were palm down on a table. The next topic is directional terms. In the anatomical position, directional terms are used to describe the relative position of one body part to another. These terms are essential for describing the relative locations of different body structure. For instance, an anatomist might describe one band of tissue as inferior to another, or a physician might describe a tumor as superficial to a deeper body structure. Commit these terms to memory to avoid confusion when you are studying or describing the locations of particular body parts. The first set of directional terms we're going to learn is left and right. Now, some of you might be thinking, am I in preschool? Even though you might think you know the meaning of left and right is straightforward, believe me, many students actually use these terms incorrectly. The point is that when observing a body in the anatomical position, the left of the body is on the observer's right and vice versa. Sometimes it can be very confusing, but keep in mind that if the structure is on your right side, it should be on the left side of your patient, picture or model. So here on this picture you can see there is a wound on the point A, which is going to be the left side of my patient because this is my right side. When this is my right side, I'm writing down with my right hand. So this should be the left side of my patient or the model or the picture. The next terms are superior and inferior. Superior describes a position above or higher than another part of the body or the part close to the head. The example, we can say the head is superior to the abdomen because the head is above to the abdomen. Inferior means part is below another part or toward the feet. We can say the neck is inferior to the chin. On this torso model, you can see how the organs are organized in our thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. So in our thoracic cavity, we have lungs here. Between lungs, there is a heart located. And here in abdominal pelvic cavity, we have liver, stomach, large intestine, small intestine. So, at first, let's practice on right and left. This is my right. inferior to the lung. The stomach and diaphragm. Diaphragm is this very thin but major respiratory muscle here between the thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity. So the stomach is going to be 
inferior to the diaphragm. So here, should use the inferior term for that. The next terms are anterior or ventral and posterior or dorsal. Anterior means toward the front. Everything toward the front is going to be at anterior direction. Posterior or dorsal means toward the back. Let's practice on this picture. Here you can see the neck region. At the neck region, we have trachea on the front. Behind the trachea, there is esophagus, the digestive tract. And behind the esophagus, there is a spine, the vertebrae. Let's practice with the anterior and posterior terms. The esophagus is anterior to the spine because esophagus is going to be in front of the spine. Let's look at the location of esophagus and trachea. The esophagus is posterior to the trachea. The spine and esophagus. The spine is posterior to the esophagus. And trachea and esophagus, the trachea is anterior to the esophagus. It's very simple and easy. If you know the location of these organs, simply you can use anterior and posterior based on their situation if they are in toward the front or toward the back. Anterior and posterior can also be used to describe how you're looking at the body or organ. For example, the anterior view of the heart and posterior view of the heart. Anterior view of the heart means looking at the heart from the front. The posterior view of the heart means looking at uh, it from the back. So you're going to see that in the cardiovascular system. When we go over the heart, you can find the different structures in anterior view than the posterior view. The next uh, sets are medial and lateral. The medial describes the middle or direction toward the middle of the body. And lateral means toward the side or away the midline of the body. So if we draw an imaginary line that it can pass through the midline of the body. So here, the structures toward the midline, we can use the medial term for that. And away from the midline, we can use the lateral term for that. Okay, let's look at the torso here. The, the thoracic cavity or the chest area, you can see the lungs, the side and heart in between. And this is the midline of the body. The lungs are away from the midline. So, and the heart is toward the midline. So we can say that the heart lies medial to the lungs and lungs lie lateral to the heart. Here we go. At this picture, you can see that the heart is medial to the lung and lungs are lateral to the heart. Or even we can use the lateral and medial terms for the way that we're looking at the body or organ, the medial view or lateral view. At this picture, you can see the medial view of the foot and lateral view of the foot. The next sets are proximal and distal. Proximal describes a position in a limb that is nearer to the point of attachment or the trunk of the body. Or proximal means toward or close to the trunk or the point of origin of a part. This tall describes a position in a limb that is further from the point of attachment or the trunk of the body. 
away from or farthest from the trunk or the point of origin of a part. You allow to use proximal and distal only for limbs, for upper and lower extremities. You cannot use proximal and distal to describe the location of organs or parts for the organs we have in trunk. Do not forget, it's very important. We can use the proximal and distal for description of the location of organs or body parts that we have in our limbs, upper limb and lower limb. For example, let's look at the position of elbow and wrist. Here we have the elbow above the wrist. We can use the term proximal. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. Or let's look at the fingers and wrist. Fingers are distal to the wrist. On this skeleton model, also we can practice the proximal and distal terms. So, as I mentioned before, we only can use the proximal and distal for the parts that we have in our upper and lower limbs, not in trunk. Okay, so here it's our shoulder joint. Then we have elbow joint, wrist, fingers. Let's practice. Fingers are distal to the wrist. Shoulder joint is proximal to the elbow. Let's look at this bone here. This is the arm bone, the humerus. The arm bone, it has two ending parts. One ending part is close to the trunk and one is far from the trunk. We call this ending part, which is close to the trunk, as proximal ending. In future, you can see that we call this as proximal epiphysis or distal ending or distal epiphysis. For our lower limb as well, knee joint is proximal to the ankle joint or the hip joint is proximal to the knee joint or the ankle joint is distal to the hip joint. And also, if you want to practice the medial and lateral terms. Also here you can see that in this anatomical position at the arm, the forearm, we have two bone. One at the lateral side and one at the medial side. The lateral one we call this as radius and the medial one we call this as ulna. If you look at the fingers, our thumbs is lateral to other fingers. Our pinky is medial. Let's practice the lateral and medial terms in our lower limb as well. Here we can see that in our lower leg there is two bone. The lateral one is called fibula and the medial one is called tibia. Our big toe is medial, big toe is medial, a fifth toe is lateral. The next terms are superficial and deep. Superficial means situated close to the surface and deep means away from the body surface. For example, the way that we can use superficial and deep, we can say that the skin is superficial to the muscle because the skin is situated close to the surface. Or we can say the skeleton is deep to the skin. 
because the skeleton is away from the body surface. Also, we have some superficial veins, deep veins, or superficial muscles and deep muscles based on their situation. The next topic is regional terms identify specific areas of the body. In some cases, a descriptive word is used to identify the location. For example, the axial region. Refers to the main axis of the body, the head, neck, and trunk. The appendicular region. Appendicular region refers to the appendages your arms and legs. Other regional terms use a body part to identify a particular region of the body. For example, the term nasal, nasal region refers to the nose. Cephalic means head, frontal means forehead. The orbital is related to the eye, buccal, related to the cheek. Oral means mouth, mental, related to the chin. Occipital, if you look at the back of the head, the occipital region is related to the back of the head. Cervical means neck, thoracic for chest, axillary, the term axillary, the axillary region, let me find it here, is your armpit. Abdominal refers to the belly region. Brachial. Brachial refers to your arm. Anticubital. Anticubital. The word anti means before, and cubital refers to your elbow. So anticubital means before the elbow or front of the elbow. Antibrachial refers to the forearm. Pubic region is the above is the area above the genital. Inguinal or groin region is between the leg and genital. Femoral. Femoral. Region is the thigh. thigh. Patella region is the anterior part of your knee. Popliteal region is the back of the knee. I'm not going over all of them, but please practice through your lab assignment so you're going to learn them and use many of them during our course. The next topic is body planes and sections. If we want to observe the internal anatomy of an organ, like the brain, heart, lungs, we're going to cut the body into slices, which we call them as sections. A plane is a flat surface and a section is a two-dimensional surface of a three-dimensional structure that has been cut. The most frequently used body planes are sagittal plane, frontal or coronal plane, and transverse or horizontal plane. The frontal plane. The frontal or coronal plane is the plane, is the vertical plane which divides the body or an organ into the anterior and posterior portion. The frontal plane is often referred to a, as a coronal plane as well. So this plane runs vertically from top to bottom. It's divide the body or organ into an anterior and posterior side. Transverse or horizontal plane. This is the horizontal plane. It divides the body into 
superior and inferior portion. The next is sagittal plane. The sagittal plane or a median plane is a vertical plane or longitudinal plane that divides the body into right and left side. So this is my right side. This is the left side of picture. So here, this um, yellow line or yellow plane that you can see, it shows the sagittal or median plane. If the sagittal plane runs directly down the midline of the body and it's going to divide the body into um, the equal half right and left side because this has mid sagittal plane. If these plane it's going to divide the body to the uneven right and left side we call this as parasagittal plane okay on this picture you can see these three different body planes this one which is going to divide the body to the right and left side we call this as sagittal plane let's look at the section we can get from the sagittal plane this is a section from the sagittal plane or we call this as sagittal section sagittal section of the head this is how sagittal section of the head looks like in the picture and then here we have the horizontal or transverse plane. This is a section of transverse plane or transverse section that we got from the abdomen. And here you can see the frontal or coronal plane. And this is how the frontal section looks like through the right hip. The frontal or coronal plane is a plane which divides the body to the anterior and posterior side so here on the frontal section you can see the a cut of the right hip or at this picture you can see the sagittal frontal and transverse section of brain this is our frontal or coronal plane this is the horizontal or transverse plane and this one is sagittal plane through this sagittal plane you can see the brain section mid sagittal section of brain here you can see the coronal or frontal section of the brain and on this picture you can see the horizontal section of the brain. The next topic is body cavities and membrane. Our body contains many cavities that house internal organs. The body cavities can be segmented into ventral body cavity and dorsal body cavity. The body cavity towards the back, we call this as dorsal body cavity and body cavity towards the front or belly, we call this as ventral body cavity. The posterior or dorsal body cavity and anterior or ventral body cavity are each subdivided into smaller cavities. In dorsal cavity, we have cranial cavity, the superior part, and vertebral cavity at the inferior part. The cranial cavity houses the brain, and the spinal cavity or vertebral cavity encloses the spinal cord. The ventral cavity has two main subdivisions. The superior part, we have thoracic cavity. And at the inferior part, we have abdominal pelvic cavity. 
So thoracic cavity at superior part, abdominal pelvic cavity at the inferior part. The thoracic cavity is separated from the abdominal pelvic cavity by the respiratory muscle, which we call this as diaphragm. So here you can see the lateral view of the body, how the thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity are separated with the diaphragm. And this is the anterior view of the body. You can see the thoracic cavity here above the diaphragm and the abdominal pelvic cavity inferior to the diaphragm. The thoracic cavity has um, three subdivisions. Let's look at the thoracic cavity from the anterior view. Here we have the thoracic cavity at the chest area or thoracic cavity, there is three subdivisions for our thoracic cavity. The mediastinum and two pleural cavities. So here is one pleural cavity at the left side cause this is my right side to the left pleural cavity and this is your right pleural cavity. So, so far we covered two subdivisions of the thoracic cavity, right and left pleural cavity. And between this right and left pleural cavity, there is mediastinum. Mediastinum is the third cavity for the thoracic cavity. Mediastinum. So in this way, we subdivided our thoracic cavity to three subdivision, mediastinum and two pleural cavities. The mediastinum is between the left and right pleural cavities and also it's divided into the superior and inferior part. Let's look at the mediastinum here. We can subdivide mediastinum to the superior and the inferior mediastinum. The inferior part is called precardium. The inferior mediastinum is called pericardium. And is home to the heart. Superior mediastinum houses the esophagus, trachea, major vessels such as aorta and some other structures like our thymus gland. The pleural cavities are on either side of the mediastinum and contains the lungs. Okay, so let's look at our abdominal pelvic cavity, which here you have with the pink and green color. The abdominal pelvic cavity consists of the abdominal cavity, at the anterior view you can see with this pink color, and the pelvic cavity with the green color. But there is no structures that can separate them from each other. The abdominal cavity mostly contains the digestive organs such as stomach, liver, pancreas, gallbladder, kidneys, and most of the small and large intestine. The pelvic cavity contains urinary bladder and internal reproductive organs like the ovary in the female and some parts of large intestine like rectum. So uh, let's summarize the body cavities. So we just divided our body cavities to dorsal and ventral body cavity. Dorsal body cavity is subdivided into cranial cavity, the superior part, and vertebral cavity at the inferior part. Cranial cavity houses the brain, vertebral cavity houses the spinal cord, and then the ventral body cavity from the lateral view and from the anterior view. The ventral body cavity is divided into the thoracic cavity on the superior part and abdominal pelvic cavity on the inferior part. The thoracic cavity is subdivided into three cavities. 
left and right plural cavity which each of them houses the left lung and right lung and in between we have mediastinum which we can subdivide mediastinum to the superior mediastinum and inferior mediastinum in superior mediastinum we have esophagus trachea thymus gland aorta and the um inferior mediastinum which houses the heart we call this as precardium because cardio refers to the heart and pre means around so precardium is a cavity within the mediastinum which houses the heart and abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity we have the organs of digestive system and the urinary and reproductive system mostly here Next, next topic is serous membrane. Serous membrane or serosa is a double layered membrane which covers the wall of the ventral body cavity and the outer surface of the organs which we have inside of the ventral body cavity. The serous membrane has two layers the parietal layer and visceral layer so it consists of parietal serosa and visceral serosa the parietal layer of the membranes line the walls of the body cavity as pariet refers to the cavity wall and the visceral the visceral means uh, refers to the internal organ so the visceral membrane or the visceral layer is going to cover the internal organs the serous membrane which we have around the heart or it's going to cover the heart we call this as pericardium pleura is a serous membrane around lungs and pretonium is a serous membrane in abdominal cavity around abdominal organs so the serous membrane in general covers the wall of the ventral body cavities and organ inside of it based on their location we have three different serous membrane precardium pleura and pretonium precardium around heart pleura around lungs and pretonium for abdominal cavity and abdominal organs here on this picture you can see with the green color the pleura is a serous membrane around the lung, the precardium, serous membrane around the heart, and the pretonium, the serous membrane in our abdominal pelvic cavity. And this serous membrane, it has two layers, the parietal layer and visceral layer. This is the parietal oops, layer, sorry, the parietal layer, which is going to cover the wall of the thoracic cavity and then the visceral pleura is going to cover the lung directly so we have the parietal pleura and visceral pleura the between these two layer there is a cavity there is a space we call this as pleural cavity so pleural cavity is going to be space or cavity between parietal and visceral pleura let's look at the precardium the serous membrane around the heart it also has two layer the parietal precardium and visceral precardium visceral precardium is the inner layer which is going to cover the heart directly and pre parietal precardium is the outer layer and between these two layers we have again the precardial cavity which is filled with the serous fluid pretonium also we can divide to two layer parietal pretonium and the visceral pretonium between these two layers, we also have the pretonial cavity filled with the serous fluid. To understand the serous membrane and the two layers and how the organ is located inside of it, we should look at this analogy of a fist and a balloon. 
This illustration with a fist and balloon can help you think of how serous membrane is put together. Basically, if you push a balloon down like this, you'll have an outer layer, an inner layer. So this is your outer layer, and then this is gonna be the inner layer. We call the outer layer as parietal layer. So the outer layer is going to be the parietal layer and the visceral layer is right next to your fist, your viscera, your organ. And there is a space in between. This may be a larger space or a very, very small space, which is filled with the watery and clear fluid called a serous membrane. Uh, uh, like, sorry, serous fluid that it prevents friction as the organ move within the cavity. So here, your fist going to be your heart and this inner layer is your visceral precardium and the outer layer of your balloon going to be your uh, parietal precardium. The next topic is regarding the abdominal region and quadrants. The abdominal pelvic cavity is divided into abdominal region and quadrants. These divisions are helpful in identifying the location of particular abdominal organs and describing the location or abdominal pain. When using the nine region method, a tic-tac-toe grid um, is drawn. We call this as abdominal pelvic region, which we have one, two, three, four line, two vertical and two horizontal. These four lines is going to divide our abdominal pelvic cavity to nine regions. And then through two line, one vertical and one horizontal, we can divide our abdominal pelvic cavity to four quadrants. So in this way, these nine abdominal pelvic region, we call them as right hypochondriac region, left hypochondriac region, epigastric region in between. Hypo means below and chondrial it refers to the ribs. So hypochondriac region is a region we have below to the ribs. So it's kind of simple, right? And this is my right hand. This is the left side of the picture. So this is going to be the right hypochondriac region. And the, at this side, we have left hypochondriac region. Between these two, we have epigastric region. Gastric refers to the stomach, and epi means above, so this is a region above the stomach. Below or inferior to the right hypochondriac region, there is right lumbar region. And inferior to the right, left hypochondriac region, there is left lumbar region. Between the right and left lumbar region, there is the umbilical region, which means we have the umbilicus here. Inferior to the right and left lumbar region, there are right and left iliac region or inguinal region. And between these two, there is a hypogastric region, region below to the stomach. So in this way, we have nine region in our abdominal pelvic cavity. And based on the abdominal pelvic quadrants, we can divide our abdominal pelvic cavity to four quadrants, right upper quadrant or RUQ, left upper quadrant, LUQ, right lower quadrant, RLQ, and left lower quadrant or LLQ. You should know in each of these region and quadrant what organs do we have. So here we go. In this abdominal pelvic quadrant, at the right upper quadrant, we can find most part of the liver, gallbladder, right kidney, and portions of small and large intestine. At the left upper quadrant, mostly we have stomach, pancreas, a part of liver, left kidney, spleen, portions of small and large intestine. Do not forget. Lever, mostly we have on the right side, and spleen we have on the left side. Okay, right lower quadrant, we have here the cecum, the first part of our large intestine, 
the appendix, which is attached to the cecum, portions of a small and large intestine, and some of the reproductive organs, for example, right ovary in female, and also part of our urinary tract, the right ureter. At the leftover quadrant, mostly we have small intestine, portions of large intestine, left ureter, and left ovary in female. So here is the uh, other picture for the abdominal pelvic quadrant. At the right upper quadrant, you can find most part of the liver, the gallbladder, part of our small and large intestine, left uh, the right kidney, which is going to be deep into these organs. And at the left upper quadrant, mostly we can find the stomach here, the spleen next to the stomach, and part of our large and small intestine, and deep to these organs we can find the left kidney. On the right lower quadrant, you can find the cecum here, the appendix, part of our large intestine, small intestine, and deep to them we have the right ureter here, it's going down, and at the left lower quadrant we can find mostly the small intestine, large intestine, and also the left ureter as well. This is the abdominal pelvic region, which in the right hypochondriac region, you can find the mostly liver and gallbladder. And the epigastric region, you know that the stomach going to be here. At the left hypochondriac region, you know mostly about the spleen. Right lumbar region, we can find the ascending colon, part of our large intestine. In the umbilical region, mostly we have small intestine. On the left lumbar region, there is descending colon of large intestine, which is going down. And on the right iliac or right inguinal region, we have the cecum and appendix. On the hypogastric or pubic region, we can find the urinary bladder mostly and also part of the intestine, small intestine. And on the left iliac or inguinal region, we can find part of our sigmoid colon, part of our um, large intestine. And in female, we can find the left ovary on the left iliac region and right ovary in right iliac region. Thank you for listening.